This is like a crazy amount of power for one piece of technology. And it's happened to us so fast. You just launched GPT-5. A kid born today will never be smarter than AI. How do we figure out what's real and what's not real? We haven't put a sex bot avatar in ChatGPT yet. Super intelligence. What does that actually mean? This thing is remarkable. I'm about to interview Sam Altman, the CEO, CEO of OpenAI. 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 Reshaping industries. Dude's a straight up tech lord, let's be honest. Right now, they're trying to build a super intelligence that could far exceed humans in almost every field. And they just released their most powerful model yet. Just a couple years ago, that would have sounded like science fiction. Not anymore. In fact, they're not alone. We're in the middle of the highest stakes global race any of us have ever seen. Hundreds of billions of dollars and an unbelievable amount of human work. This is a profound moment. Most people never live through a technological shift like this, and it's happening all around you and me right now. So in this episode, I want to try to time travel with Sam Altman into the future that he's trying to build to see what it looks like so that you and I can really understand what's coming. Welcome to Huge Conversations. How are you? Great to meet you. Thanks for doing this. Absolutely. So before we dive in, I'd love to tell you my goal here. Okay. I'm not going to ask you about valuation or AI talent wars or fundraising Thank or you. anything like that. I think that's all very well covered elsewhere. It does seem like it. Our big goal on this show is to cover how we can use science and tech to make the future better. And the reason that we do all of that is because we really believe that if people see those better futures, they can then help build them. So my goal here is to try my best to time travel with you into different moments in the future that you're trying to build and see what it looks like. Fantastic. Awesome. Starting with what you just announced. You recently said, surprisingly recently, that GPT-4 was the dumbest model any of us will ever have to use again. But GPT-4 can already perform better than 90% of humans at the SAT and the LSAT and the GRE, and it can pass coding exams and sommelier exams and medical licensing. Yeah. And now you just launched GPT-5. What can GPT-5 do that GPT-4 can't? First of all, one important takeaway is you can have an AI system that can do all those amazing things you just said. And it doesn't, it clearly does not replicate a lot of what humans are good at doing, which I think says something about the value of SAT tests or whatever else. But I think had you gone back to, if we were having this conversation the day of GPT-4 launch and we told you how GPT-4 Surprise, did those things, you were like, oh man, this is going to have huge impacts and some negative impacts on what it means for a bunch of jobs or, you know, what people are going to do. And, you know, this is a bunch of positive impacts that you might have predicted that haven't yet come true. Uh, and, and so there, there's something about the way that these models are good that does not capture a lot of other things that we need people to, to do or care about people doing. And I suspect that same thing is going to happen again with GPT-5. People are going to be blown away by what it does. Uh, it's really good at a lot of things. And then they will find that they want it to do even more. Um, people will use it for all sorts of incredible things. Uh, it will transform a lot of knowledge work, a lot of the way we learn, a lot of uh, the way we create. Um, but we, people, society will co-evolve with it to expect more with, you know, better tools. So yeah, like, I think this model is quite remarkable in many ways, quite limited in others. But the fact that for, you know, three minute, five minute, one hour tasks that uh, like an expert in a, in a field could maybe do or maybe struggle with that the fact that you have in your pocket one piece of software that can do all of these things mm -hmm. is really amazing. I think this is like unprecedented at any point in human history that I that a technology has improved this much this fast and and the fact that we have this tool now, you know, we're like living through it and we're kind of adjusting step by step, but if we could go back in time 5 or 10 years and say this thing was coming, we would be like probably not. <laughs> Let's assume that people haven't seen the headlines. What are the top line specific things that you're excited about? And also the things that you seem to be caveating, the things that yeah. maybe you won't expect it to do. Um, the thing that I am most excited about is this is a model for the first time where I feel like I can ask kind of any hard scientific or technical question mm. and get a pretty good answer. And I'll give a fun example, actually. Yeah, uh, 
when I was in junior high, uh, or maybe it was ninth grade, I got a TI-83, this old graphing calculator. And I spent so long making this game called Snake. Yeah. Uh, it was a very popular game with kids in my school. And I was, I was like, uh, I was like proud when it was done, but it was like programming on a TI-83 was extremely painful. It took a long time. And it was really hard to like debug and whatever. And on a whim with an early copy of GPT-5, I was like, I wonder if it can make a TI-83 style game of Snake. Hmm. And of course it did that perfectly in like seven seconds. And then I was like, okay, am I supposed to be, would my like 11 year old self think this was cool or like, you know, miss something from the process? And I had like three seconds of wondering like, oh, is this good or bad? And then I immediately said, actually, now I'm missing this game. I have this idea for a crazy new feature. Let me type it in. It implements it. And it just, the game live updates. And now I'm like, actually, I'd like it to look this way. Actually, I'd like to do this thing. And I had this like, this very like kind of, you have this experience that reminded me of being like 11 and programming again, where I was just like, I can, I want to try this. Now I have this idea. Now I yeah. But I could do it so fast and I could like express ideas and try things and play with things in such real time. I was like, oh man, you know, I was worried for a second about kids like missing the struggle of learning to program in this sort of stone age way. And now I'm just thrilled for them because the, the way that people be able to create with these new tools, the speed with which you can sort of bring ideas to life, you know, in that's that's pretty amazing. So this idea that GPT-5 can just not only like answer all these hard questions for you, but really create like on-demand, almost instantaneous software. That's I think that's going to be one of the defining elements of the GPT-5 era in a way that did not exist with GPT-4. As you're talking about that, I find myself thinking about a concept in weightlifting of time under tension. Yeah. And for those who don't know, it's you can squat 100 pounds in three seconds or you can squat 100 pounds in 30. You gain a lot more yeah. by squatting it in 30. And when I think about our creative process and when I've felt most like I've done my best work, it has required an enormous amount of you have to sit there and struggle. time under yeah. tension. And I think that that cognitive time under tension is so important. And it's, it's ironic almost because these tools have taken enormous cognitive time under tension to develop. But in some ways, I do think people might say they're you people are using them as a escape hatch for thinking in some ways, maybe. Now, you might say, yeah, but we did that with the calculator and we just moved on to harder math problems. Do you feel like there's something different happening here? How do you think about this? It's different. With the, I mean, there are some people who are clearly using ChatGPT not to think. And there are some people who are using it to think more than they ever have before. I am hopeful that we will be able to build the tool in a way that encourages more people to stretch their brain with it a little more and be able to do more. And I think that like, you know, society is a competitive place. Like if you give people new tools, uh, in theory, maybe people just work less, but in practice, it seems like people work ever harder and the expectations of people just go up. So my, my guess is that like other tools, uh, some people or like other pieces of technology, some people will do more and some people will do less, but Certainly for the people who want to use ChatGPT to increase their cognitive time under tension, they are really able to. Mm -hmm. And it is, I take a lot of inspiration from what like the top 5% of most engaged users do with ChatGPT. Like it's really amazing how much people are learning and doing and, you know, outputting. So my, I've only had GPT-5 for a couple hours, so I've been playing What with do you it. think so far? I'm I'm just learning how to interact with it. I mean, part of the interesting thing is I feel like I just caught up on how to use GPT-4 and now I'm trying to learn how to G use GPT-5. I'm curious what the specific tasks that you've found most interesting are, because I imagine you've been using it for a while now. I, I have been most impressed by the coding tasks. I mean, there's a lot of other things it's really good at, but this, I, this idea of the AI can write software for anything and that means that you can express ideas in new ways that the AI can do very advanced things. It can do, you know, it can like, in, in some sense, you could like ask GPT-4 anything, but because GPT-5 is so good at programming, it feels like it can do anything. Of course, it can't do things in the physical world, but it can get a computer to do very complex things. And software is this super powerful, you know, way to like control some stuff and actually do some things. So that, that for me has been the most striking 
Um, it's got it's much better at writing. Hmm. So this is like there's this whole thing of AI slop, like AI writes in this kind of like quite annoying way. And M dashes. And that we still have the M dashes and GPT five. A lot of people like the M dashes, but the writing quality of GPT five is gotten much better. We still have a long way to go. We want to improve it more, but like uh I've a thing we've heard a lot from people inside of OpenAI is that man, they started using GPT five. They knew it was better on all the metrics, but there's this like nuanced quality they can't quite articulate. But then when they have to go back to GPT four to test something, mm. it feels terrible. <laughs> and I I don't know exactly what the cause of that is, but I suspect part of it is the writing feels so much more natural and better. I, in preparation for this interview, reached out to a couple other leaders in AI and technology and gathered a couple questions for you. Okay. 